good afternoon, good evening. I'm not 100% sure when you are tuning uh, into this. Um, it's Thursday evening at uh, this current moment, and uh, we have just finished filming uh, Sunday's message, what you are about uh, to listen to. If you're a first-time uh, person tuning in on behalf of Rooted Fellowship, I want to welcome you. Uh, we're glad that you have considered us to be a safe space to come and journey uh, as we seek to know more about who Jesus is. Um, if you're a regular, uh, welcome home. Uh, we long uh, to be in one space together. Uh, we pray uh, that this pandemic would come to an end. Uh, but even if it doesn't, uh, God is still seated on his throne and still fully in control. Uh, it's been an incredible evening. Uh, I don't know, maybe you can hear uh, the rustling and the bustling in the background, people talking. Um, but I believe God showed up this morning. Um, you're about to listen to a uh, a message uh, that I just preached, um, and so it'll be fresh to you. Uh, it's an unusual text, uh, but it's still the very Word of God, and, and my hope is that it would encourage you, uh, and it would take you from uh, wherever you are to a better place, uh, and there is no better place than to be in the presence of our Father through Jesus by the power of the Holy Spirit. So um, I hope you enjoy this message. Uh, if you want to reach out to us, if anything uh, sticks out for you, and if the Holy Spirit is uh, pressing on your heart and you want to ask us some questions. Maybe you want to give your life to Jesus and you've never done that before. I ask that you reach out to us at Community at Rooted Fellowship. We'd love to hear from you. Uh, there'll be a screen at the end of all of this that has all our details. Uh, we love you. Um, enjoy. Hey, everyone. Uh, welcome to Rooted Digital. Uh, we are currently in a sermon series looking at the book of Mark or the gospel according to Mark. We've been uh, in this gospel for the last year and a bit, uh, but we are coming to a close. Uh, there are, I believe, only two more sermons left, uh, and, uh, and it's been absolutely encouraging uh, walking through this gospel, looking at the life of Jesus and asking the question, what does that mean for us? Uh, I've heard many great things from many of you who have been deeply uh, encouraged uh, by this sermon series, and, uh, and we praise God for it. Um, so today we're going to be in Mark chapter 13. Uh, we're going to look at uh, 31 verses, and so we have quite a bit to get through. Um, but I'm going to encourage you to, to stay on track with us. Uh, in fact, I'd actually encourage you to get a notebook uh, or get your Bible, get something to scribble uh, some of the stuff um, that we're going to talk about, because some of it I'm not going to be able to go in depth just because of time, uh, but it is something that you could later uh, look at and then try to find how it connects to the rest of the Bible. And so Mark chapter 13. Now, uh, this is a very challenging chapter. Um, it really is. It's a challenging chapter. If you read uh, commentary after commentary, you'll see that many people have wrestled uh, with Mark chapter 13. Uh, and here's why. I'm going to give you three reasons to why uh, this uh, chapter is challenging. Right? It's important for us to know uh, before we jump in. And so, number one, Mark uh, chapter 13 is filled with what is known as apocalyptic literature. All right, apocalyptic literature. And no, I'm not talking about zombies or uh, some strange movie that you have watched. I think Mel Gibson has a movie somewhat titled uh, to that. It's not what I'm talking about. Apocalyptic literature is a specific form of prophecy, largely involving symbols and imagery and predicting disaster and destruction. We see this kind of language in Daniel 7, in Ezekiel chapter 1, uh, and in Revelation 9. And so uh, because of this, it can be somewhat confusing. Is how much of this is symbolic and how much of this is real? Um, and we have to wrestle with that. Uh, the other reason that Mark chapter 13 is challenging is that it has a non-linear feel to it. Uh, this is where events are portrayed out of chronological order or the logical order in the story, right? So the pattern of events needs to jump around and not follow a linear pattern. Uh, you'll see that we're going to go to the past and the future while wrestling with the present, right? That, it's very apparent in this chapter. And then lastly, because of the apocalyptic literature style and the non-linear realities, Mark 13 creates a lot of yes and yes. Yes and yes to questions 
that seem like they should be yes and no. And yet, we're going to see in the text, it's going to be yes and yes. Are you confused? Great. Uh, let's get to work. And so we find ourselves in uh, the text where Jesus has just spent a significant uh, portion of his time talking to opposers to the true faith. Uh, he's been chatting to the Sadducees, the Pharisees, the scribes, and they're opposing him. You know, they're coming at him and challenging him. And he's answering question after question after question. And it's incredible. It's like no one can stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with Jesus and win. And so he's wrapping this up. They are now leaving the temple, him and his disciples. And that's where we pick up the chapter. Verse 1. It says, as he was going out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Teacher, look, what massive stones, what impressive Buildings. Now, I believe they're saying this, not only because the temple was incredibly impressive. I would uh, ask you to go and Google it. It's absolutely amazing. Uh, but I also believe uh, that they had just kind of walked uh, through this kind of arena, engaging with the different leaders, the different religious leaders, and, and they won. And so it's almost like, look, Jesus beat all of you. And so it's only a matter of time before he is now in power and then we are sitting next to him, ruling the temple and the Jewish people together. That's probably what they're thinking. And so they're looking at this building and they're like, man, this is impressive because this is soon, it's going to be ours. Verse 2, Jesus said to them, do you see these great buildings? Not one stone will be left upon another. All will be thrown down. The NLT translation says it this way. Yes, look at these great buildings, but they will be completely demolished. Not one stone will be left on top of another. Now, this statement would have been alarming to any Jewish person living in that time. Not so much to us. Because I believe in many ways we have lost the significance of the temple and its purposes. From the events of Matthew 27, verse 51, we're able to realize that through the sacrifice of Jesus, the temple veil, which separated the holy place from the holy of holies, was torn into from top to bottom, granting access. The redemption story is that the banished sinner now is restored to his or her rightful place in fellowship with God, fulfilling the cry of God's heart from the very beginning. See, Jesus' words here, where he says, no, this, this temple will be destroyed, would have left a few questions in the minds of the disciples. Uh, let me share a few of those questions. Uh, question number one would be, well, if, if the temple will be destroyed, where will we make sacrifices? Uh, how will our sins be forgiven? You see, the temple was where they went to make sacrifices. Another question that probably popped up in the minds of the disciples was, how will we meet with God? If the temple is destroyed, what's the plan? And then the, the third one is, if the temple is destroyed, what will the priests do? Jesus, are you planning to hand out retrenchment packages? Like, what, what, what's going to happen to them and their function and their role? Let me give some brief answers to these questions. How will we sacrifice? Well, Jesus' sacrifice is the ultimate sacrifice. Because of his completed work on the cross, uh, there will be no need for uh, blood sacrifices again. He is the ultimate sacrifice, and, and so there he answers that question. How will we meet with God? Well, because Jesus now lives in us by the power of the Holy Spirit, we now have direct access to God. Whenever and wherever. 1 Corinthians 3.16. And what about the priests? I'm glad you asked. We no longer need priests because we are now a royal priesthood. 1 Peter 2.9. So much more could be said, but friends, that's not the point of the sermon. I just wanted to bring you into the tension of the text and 
the disciples. That this is no small thing that Jesus is saying. But let's keep going. Verse 3. While he was sitting on the Mount of Olives across from the temple, Peter, James, John, and Andrew asked him privately. I love that they did that privately. It's like they pulled him to the side. Because they, they had just seen what happens when you ask foolish questions to Jesus. It doesn't end well. So they, so they pull him to the side and they go, tell us, when will these things happen? And what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished? Jesus told them, watch out. Watch out that no one deceives you. Many will come in my name saying, I am he, and they will deceive many. Sound familiar? It's happening today. Verse 7, when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, don't be alarmed. These things must take place, but it is not yet the end. For nation will rise up against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places and famines. I believe if they were writing this today, they could easily say there will be pandemics, poverty, injustice at a global level. These are the beginning of birth pain. So another translation says it this way, but this is only the first of the birth pains, with more to come, with more to come. See, uh, this illustration, this uh, illustration of the beginning of birth pains, it lands for me, not because I have personally experienced birth pains, um, but because I have witnessed my wife experience them. And if you're a wife uh, who has had children or a woman who has had children, you understand what this means. Having been prepared through countless evenings of prenatal classes, that when the birth pains began for my wife, and we made our way to the hospital, we both knew that this was only the beginning and that it's only going to get worse. And so when Jesus says this, He's saying to us, you, you, you heard of rumors of war, nation against nation. It's only going to get worse. It's because of the brokenness of this world. The brokenness of this world. And so hence Jesus warns us in verse 9, but you be on guard. They will hand you over to local courts And you will be flogged in the synagogues. You will stand before governors and kings because of me as a witness to them. I love how the NLT puts this uh, portion here. It says, but this will be your opportunity to tell them about me. While you're standing there before governors and kings, while you're being flogged, he says, no, 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 don't miss it. This will be your opportunity to tell them about me. Verse 10, and it is necessary that the gospel be preached to all nations. So when they arrest you and hand you over, don't worry beforehand what you will say, but say whatever is given to you at that time, for it isn't you speaking but the Holy Spirit. See, Jesus tells us that the faithful will be persecuted. That's what he's saying here. That the faithful will be persecuted. And these are are words I'm pretty sure many of us, we, we don't want to hear. We don't want to hear that. But I believe these are words that we need to hear. See, I believe too many churches call people to Jesus and make promises on his behalf that he never made. Or, or they, 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 they take words out of context, literally cutting out parts of the Bible that doesn't suit them. Now, don't get me wrong. I do believe that coming to Jesus has massive blessings in this life and 100% in the next I believe that we are to seek to enjoy the benefits of the kingdom of God here, right now, while we wait for Jesus to return 
for he calls us home. But the Bible is clear. The Bible is clear. Those who are faithful will be persecuted. I think of Galatians chapter 5 that encourages me as I think about the various blessings that we are to experience even in the midst of persecution. A very well-known portion of Scripture. It's the fruit of the Holy Spirit. See, uh, Jesus wants us to embrace and to enjoy all the fruit of the Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faith, gentleness, and self-control. The passage goes on to say, there is no law against these things. And so we're to press into this as we seek to be faithful. And as we do so, these are the very things that, that keep us together, that allow us to navigate through these difficult times that Jesus speaks of if you seek to be faithful. Again, I wish I could say more about this. How, 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 does, one, how does one navigate through this broken world being faithful but re realizing, recognizing that persecution is coming? And it is coming. Matthew 10, Matthew 5 verse 10 says, Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for the kingdom of heaven is theirs. Luke 6, verse 22, Blessed are you when people hate you, when they exclude you, insult you, and slander your name as evil because of the Son of Man. 2 Timothy 3, 12, In fact, all who want to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. It is a reality for all those who seek to be faithful. But we are able to stand because we have the fruit of the Spirit in us. And so we can show love. We can show joy. We can show patience and kindness, faith, gentleness, self-control. Jesus tells us not to worry when we're in those situations. That we are to lean into the power and the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. It's him who will give us the words to speak. Which means, some of us need to hear this part, which means that if he doesn't give us words, then we're to zip it. Say nothing. And again, we see Jesus doing that. There are moments when he's being persecuted, he speaks, and then there are moments when he's being persecuted and he says nothing. Because he is secure in his identity. He knows who he is. He knows who he belongs to, and so should we. Jesus says in John 15, verse 18, If the world hates you, remember that it hated me first. Remember that it hated me first. Let's go back to Mark chapter 13, continue with what Jesus is saying from verse 12. He says, brother will betray brother to death and the father his child. Children will rise up against parents and have them put to death. You will be hated by everyone. Why? Because of my name. Because of my name. Not your name. No your glory, his name, and for his glory. But the one who endures to the end will be saved. These are prophetic words by Jesus, as he's telling them. They are prophetic words. Because he was only moments away from being betrayed. Only moments away from being killed by those who a few days had just praised him but all of a sudden now hate him. And so he's, he's not saying this in a vacuum. He's saying, guys, I, I want you to know this. It's about to happen to me, but I want you to know beforehand. I also want you to see the promise at the end of these difficult words, because these are difficult words. But there is a promise at the end of these words. 
You see, we often pray for God to remove the persecution. We pray for him to remove the challenge. We pray for him to remove the trials, which we should. Which we should. In fact, I believe we should pray more. But I often wonder, should we also pray for power to endure? For power to endure and to endure until the end. I wonder if we pray like that. And notice he, he doesn't say the end of what. I sometimes feel that we read too quickly. He doesn't say the end of what. And so this could be the end of whatever it is that you are experiencing, the, the, the challenge that you are going through. Endure until the end of that. But as history has shown us, and those who've gone before us, it could also mean enduring to the end of your life. That this is a persecution, that this is a challenge, that this is a trial, that you are called to endure until your final breath. The promise is true. He or she who endures to the end will be saved. And so either way, there is saving at the end for those who persevere in Christ. You should encourage us. But let's keep going. Verse 14. Jesus says, when you see the abomination of desolation standing where it should not be, let the reader understand. Then those in Judea must flee to the mountains. Now, the inner circle knew exactly what Jesus meant by the abomination of desolation standing where it should not be. Right? I believe they, they understood this. If, if you're familiar with the Old Testament, you, you would have an understanding of what Jesus meant here. You see, this term originated in the prophetic words of Daniel in chapter 9, verse 27 chapter 11, verse 31, and then later again in chapter 12, verse 11. And they described a coming figure who would desecrate and violate the temple and stop daily sacrifices from occurring. It meant an abomination so despicable it would cause the temple to be abandoned by the people of God. And this had happened historically. When Jesus is saying this, it had happened in 167 BC when a, a guy called King Antiochus Epiphanes believed that he was the incarnation of Zeus. He gave himself the name Antiochus Epiphanes, the illustrious one. He would say to people, I am God made manifest. See, he conquered Jerusalem and not only stopped sacrifices as was prophesied, but he dedicated an altar to Zeus. He also took a pig and sacrificed it on the altar. Now you can only imagine for the Jewish people, this was horrendous. But he sacrificed it on the altar, and then he spread the pig's blood all inside the temple. Not only that, he banned the people from keeping the Sabbath. Not only that, he stopped all circumcision. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. Antiochus slaughtered many Jews and took many captive. He made them slaves. This abomination caused the Jews to abandon the temple until their successful revolt against this heinous religion. Now, obviously, as terrible as Antiochus had been, he didn't completely fulfill the prophecies in Daniel. For Jesus said another abomination was coming. Right? So he, he's looking to the past, but he's saying, no, 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 in the present, with his disciples, he's like, no, there's, there's one coming. Hashtag never stops. I'm sure that's the feeling of the disciples. What another one is coming? And so let's take a look at history. Was Jesus maybe not speaking of the Roman siege on Jerusalem that happened in A.D. 70? He's 
future, our past? I believe he is. And more. This is one of those yes and yes. Say, say with me. See, this attack took place around the time of Passover. It was led by the Roman general Titus. And since the siege coincided with Passover, the Romans allowed the pilgrims, he allowed the people to enter the city but refused to let them leave. Therefore, strategically depleting food and water supplies within Jerusalem as the days went by. Within the walls, the zealots, uh, who were a militant anti-Roman party, struggled with other Jewish factions that emerged, which weakened the resistance even more. Friends, it was carnage. Hence, Jesus says, then those in Judea must flee to the mountains. A man on the housetop must not come down or go in to get anything out of his house. And a man in the field must not go back to get his coat. Woe to pregnant women and nursing mothers in those days. Pray it won't happen in winter. That's detail here. Matthew says it like this, speaking of the same account. At the end, he says, pray that your escape may not be in winter or on a Sabbath. Friends, what happened here was absolute chaos and carnage. Josephus, first century theologian and historian, records them as leaving the city as swimmers deserting a sinking ship. He says that's, that, that's the imagery. That's what was going on. It, it was, it was carnage and, and chaos and crazy. It was like people leaving a sinking ship. An image that affirms very well with Jesus' command to leave everything behind. When a, a, a ship is sinking, there is no time to say, hold on, I quickly need to go to my room and get something. The panic, the urgency, leave now. The horror which Jesus predicted for Jerusalem in the powerful prophetic language of verses 17 to 20 came with the fall of the temple and is a matter of historical fact. You can go and read about this. It, it really happened. In verse 20, he says, If the Lord had not cut those days short, no one would be saved. No one would be saved. The roofs were swamped with famished women with babies in their arms and, and, and the alleys with corpses of the elderly. I want you to picture that for a moment. Children swollen from starvation. Roaming around like phantoms through the marketplaces. Collapsed everywhere because doom overtaken. There was no grieving or weeping because famine had strangled their emotions. Nothing left. Jerusalem could not bury all the bodies, so they were simply tossed over the wall. The, the, the stench was just way too much. The silence was broken only by the laughter of robbers stripping the dead bodies. So the attack and the destruction of the temple in AD 70, yes, yes. And also, I personally believe that the abomination of desolation will find its ultimate fulfillment in the future and that the destruction of Jerusalem here in the text is a prototype, a picture, a model which contains the essential elements of the great tribulation at the end of time. Jesus is, is now getting us to focus on the future, way beyond uh, the, the AD, 70 AD, AD 70. 
I believe that this is true because Paul affirms this line of thinking when he says, for that day will not come until there is a great rebellion against God and the man of lawlessness is revealed, the one who brings destruction. He will exalt himself and defy everything that people call God and every object of worship. He will even sit in the temple of God claiming that he himself is God. This passage affirms the view that the abomination of desolation refers to the ultimate, the ultimate antichrist who will also fulfill Daniel's prophecies. The destruction of Jerusalem and the beginning of a God-assuming somebody of the highest degree will signify the approach of the end of the age. That's a lot. Can we agree that, that, that that's a lot? Now, now I know we, we are living in times where, where we might point to someone and go, is that, is that the individual? Is that the individual? Yes and yes. But, but we should not take our eyes off the ultimate individual. Let's keep going. Verse 19 says, for those, for those will be days of tribulation, the kind that hasn't been from the beginning of creation until now and never will be again. If the Lord had not cut those days short, no one would be saved. But he cut those days short for the sake of the elect whom he chose sake of the elect whom he chose. Now, the elect, uh, this phrase is such a controversial one because it speaks of predestination. I was in a robust conversation a couple days ago with a friend who struggles with the Bible because of a phrase like this, the elect, those who have been predestined. You see, so many people wrestle with this. They ask themselves, I thought God loves the whole world and wants no one to perish. So why, why is there an elect and a chosen? Well, he does love the whole world and he doesn't want anyone to perish. That's true, John 3.16. And God also in his sovereign, all-knowing wisdom has chosen the elect. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4. The Father. That there is an invitation and also an election. Here's the best way uh, that I can explain it, and I've used this uh, many times over the years, trying to explain that, yes, there is this invitation that is given to everyone, but there are those that God has chosen. Here's how I communicate it. Let's say you're standing outside the door of heaven. You're not in, you're outside. And you hear this invitation. In fact, on, on uh, the top of the door, there are these words, big and bold, all are invited. All are invited. And, and so you accept the, cha the invitation. You accept it and you walk through the doors. You cross the line of faith. You become a Christian. You surrender to Jesus as Lord and Savior. But before you carry on, you look back. You look back at the door, and on top, it says there, you are chosen. And so what I simply mean by that is that for everyone, as I stand here and, and teach God's word, I want everyone to know that you are all invited, young and old, male and female, rich and poor, you are all invited. The door is there in front of you. And God says, come. If you surrender, you lay it all down and you walk through that door. You are chosen. Verse 21, he says, Then if anyone tells you, see, here is the Messiah. See there. Do not believe it. For false messiahs and false prophets will arise and will perform signs and wonders to lead, to lead astray, if possible, the elect. And you must watch. 
I have told you everything in advance. See, Jesus warns them to be vigilant. False prophets and false messiahs will arise. They're here today. We don't have to go too far. They're on our television screens, on billboards. And we're told to be vigilant, to not be fooled. They will perform signs and wonders. We must not forget that Satan can perform signs and wonders. See, these individuals will not glorify God, but they will seek to glorify themselves. So watch out. Be on guard. Stay alert. Jesus warns us. He warns his disciples. He warns us. Now, having told the disciples everything about the fall of the temple, Jesus jumped thousands of years into the future to inform them of his second coming. He connects all of this. He doesn't give them a date, but only that it is on the other side of this destruction. Jesus then transitions. It's as if his eyes went from the temple and he now begins to look beyond it. As he continued speaking, it's very Jesus-like, almost like in one swift moment. If you you blink, you'll miss it, right? There's the temple and he's talking and then he says, okay, but now I, I see something else. I want to draw your attention to something else. He says in verse 24, But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun will be darkened, and the moon will not shed its light, and the stars will be falling from the sky, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. He will send out the angels and gather his elect from the four winds, from the ends of the earth to the ends of heaven. Now there's a lot here. In these few verses, there's a lot. I want you to know that almost everything that Jesus says here can be connected to the Old Testament. If we had time, we could literally go phrase by phrase. It would make for a great morning devotional, right? So I encourage you to go and do that. But for the sake of time, let me summarize. We see that the end will have unnatural disasters. That's clear in the text. The language suggests a heavenly earthquake as star after star falls and the universe moves towards disorder. Earth's own star, the sun, darkens, and the moon will no longer reflect anything. In this cosmological confusion, Jesus will come in shining clouds of glory. He is the Son of Man that Daniel speaks of. He is the Ancient of Days. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. So take heart. In the midst of all the chaos, be encouraged. Stay hopeful. We're told that his angels are dispersed, not as grim reapers, but as joyous reapers to the harvest as Jesus gathers his church from every corner of the world. It's harvesting time. And friends, this, as the church, this is our dream. Today, this is our dream. But I want you to know that it will be our reality one day. For those who are in Jesus, this will be our reality. We will see him coming in all glory. So, like the disciples, my hope is that it leaves you wondering, when will this happen? This is good news, because I look at the brokenness of the world, and I'm longing for that day. So when? When will this happen? Jesus answers our question with a parable. Verse 28. He says, learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its branch becomes tender and sprouts leaves, you know that summer is near. In the same way, when you see these things happening, recognize that he is near at the door. 
Truly, I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things take place. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. See, this parable of the fig tree has been interpreted in a few different ways. Some are of the opinion that this part here is only referring to the nation of Israel, uh, the fig tree sprouting, meaning that uh, Israel uh, will become a nation again. Yes, I believe it means more. I don't believe that, uh, that Jesus is only speaking of the nation of Israel. And I say this because of Luke's account of the same thing, uh, Luke chapter 21, where he says, Jesus says this, uh, notice the fig tree or any other tree. So, so not just the fig tree, but any other tree. When the leaves come out, you know without being told that summer is near. Here's what I believe Jesus is saying. When you begin to see certain things happening in the present, they are an indication of what's coming in the future. One could say it's pretty simple. If we look at the present, it should tell us of what's coming. And remember, he's already told us. You can tell what the future will bring by seeing certain things unfold now. You can tell he's coming by certain events that he speaks about. That after a winter of tribulation, there will be a springtime of blessing. You will see these things happening and you will know that his coming is close. And he's speaking primarily of the tribulation period and his second coming. That, that's what he's unpacking here in Mark 13. Now, I wanted to, to say more. I wanted to keep going because there are some golden nuggets that he says after this, but I'm going to pause here. I'm going to let Sikle, who's going to come after me uh, next week, and he's going to continue on this teaching. He's going to use this as a launching pad to continue to speak of Jesus' second coming. But I, I want us to, to almost sit in this for a moment and recognize the heaviness of what Jesus has just said. It's a lot, I know. And, and in many ways, it can feel academic, but I want it to go from the head to the heart. And in doing so, maybe let me ask a question. Having heard all of this, all that Jesus has just said to us, what must we do? Let's make it personal. What must I do? What is the Bible calling me to do? What should be my response to what Jesus has just said? Well, the answer is clear. It's woven throughout this entire chapter. Jesus repeats it several times. You should go back and read the entire chapter again and read it slowly. He tells his disciples, he tells us, well, what is our response to all of this? Watch out. Stay alert. Be on guard. It's clear. And so for uh, the folks tuning in and, and, and for those uh, listening in, if you are not a Christian, I want you to hear the urgency of Jesus' words. Watch out. That great tribulation is coming. Jesus' second coming is imminent. And so if you are not a Christian, then would you, would you cross the line of faith? Would you bend the knee to Jesus? Would you confess that he is Lord? Acts 3 verse 19 says this. This is Peter preaching in the temple. He says to those in his presence, now repent of your sins and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped away. What Peter says, I say today, nothing's changed. Repent. It's to turn from whatever it is that you are running to, hoping to find life and meaning. Turn to Jesus. Now. 
because that time is imminent. Now is the most important time of your life. So many of us, we, we, we want to put it aside and say, you know, I'll get to that later. I'll get to that tomorrow. You are not promised a tomorrow. Now. But maybe you are a Christian. You are a child of God. You have surrendered your life to Jesus. And so what is your response? How are you to respond to what Jesus is saying? It's not salvation because you've already come to faith, but for you, it's to endure. It's what many of us would call sanctification. It's this idea of being molded and shaped to become more and more like Jesus. It's, it's continually surrendering your life to him, recognizing him as king, persevering to the end. It's enduring. I want to read you James um, chapter 2, verses 2 to 4. These are some of my favorite verses in the Bible. James writes, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity of great joy. Other translations say it this way, count it pure joy when trials come your way. Now, that's strange for anyone to say, let alone James, Jesus' younger brother. Why? Why should we consider this pure joy? Well, he says in verse 3, For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow, James says. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing Nothing, lacking nothing. And friends, that's what we should strive for. This, this maturity where, where we lack nothing. But we must endure. We must persevere. We must look at the challenges in our lives and go, hold on, Jesus said something about this. For those who are faithful, Jesus said something about this. It's close. It's around the corner. So I am to persevere. I am to continue to be faithful so that I, I might be counted as one of those who was mature, who lacked nothing because my hope was in Jesus. And so that's how we respond. Now is the most important moment of your life. Right now. And it starts with an act of faith and obedience. It starts with an act of faith and obedience. And so I want you to take some time to just think about those areas of your life where there is no faith. Those areas of your life where there is disobedience. Where you have found yourself caught up in the challenges of this life and have turned away from Jesus. And you've turned away from his words. The Holy Spirit is calling us to come back. To come back to him. He will give us the necessary strength to do so. He will allow us to endure. Whether it's in your marriage, your family life, your work life. Whether it's in the brokenness that we see when we pull out of our home. He will give us all that we need until he returns or calls us home. But we are to remain faithful. We are to remain obedient. Because he says, for those who endure, they will be saved. And my hope is that all of us would be saved. That's Jesus' hope, and that is why he tells us of these devastating times not to discourage us, but to point us to something far greater than our current circumstances. And so will we take that step of faith and obedience? My hope is that we will. We will be counted as those who were faithful. Let's pray. And so, Father God, we are, 
we come asking that you would take a hold of our hearts. That you are aware of our circumstances, our realities, our challenges. That you are not disconnected from what we go through. Both in our personal lives and the things that happen beyond our lives. Father, you know the pain, the grief, the sorrow that exists even in this room. The uncertainty of tomorrow because of the chaos of today. Father, I pray that we would come back to your word, to passages like Mark 13, and be reminded that These things simply are telling us that your return is close. And that soon, Father, soon, Jesus, your Son, will return. He will come through the clouds with great glory. And he will gather all the saints, the church. And that we will go to a place where there will be no more pain, no more frustration, we will be completely restored and completely healed. We will enjoy you forever. And so Lord, my hope, the cry of my heart is that there would be more and more people that even as we are praying this, that you are saving many, that you are softening the hearts of many. That you are bringing them to a place where they recognize what you have accomplished on the cross that you are a good father. Lord, I pray for the injustice that prevails in our societies. That while these words are true, that we are to be on guard, to stay alert, to watch out, the church is also called to engage. We engage with truth and with hope that as we share the message of Jesus, as people bend the knee and confess that they are reconciled back to the Father. And so, Lord, I pray that you would make us a people who truly are salt and light to this world. That while we preach of your second coming, we also tell people that now is the most important moment of their lives. Help us, Father. Help us to be faithful and to be obedient. Because you are faithful. You remain faithful. You never fail us. You never leave us or abandon us. You'll never forsake us. And so, Lord, we praise you. We worship you. In Jesus' beautiful name we pray.